I ran into a problem this week getting my 3D printer to produce a part with accurate dimensions. This is a common problem with 3D printers, so today we'll take a look at the problem, talk about what causes it, and show how to fix it. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. This week I was working on a test jig to test the electronic lead screw PC boards that I'm gonna be selling, and I ran into a problem getting the parts to fit correctly. So I thought I would stop and make a video about this and show the issue because it affects most types of 3D printers and show you how to solve it. So this is what I'm working on. This PC board is a test fixture for testing the interface boards for the electronic lead screw. Now, this is a PC board that I designed, and it will have pogo pins on it. These are spring-loaded contacts with contact points so that I can put the PC boards that I'm manufacturing directly onto those pins so I don't have to solder connectors onto them. I can just drop them on those pins, and they'll make contact with all the required test points to test the board then this board underneath actually has a display output driver, the same as the one that is going to be used in the actual electronic lead screw. It's got a network of components of inductors and capacitors up here to simulate the cable that will connect this board to the display. So I can verify two-way communication with that. It's also got optocouplers on the board that can simulate the uh, inputs and outputs for the servo or stepper driver, and it's got a bank of resistors to simulate the load of the external microcontroller so that I can actually test the voltage regulator as well. And uh, this is all going to sit on top of another launch pad board. So the launch pad board will be running the firmware, and this is the interface test fixture that will be used to test the, uh, the PC boards before I sell them. So I can drop every board on here and it'll run a test ideally in a second or two and then display the status on these LED, red and green LEDs over here and then I know the board's good. Well, just stacking up the PC boards like this isn't gonna be adequate. At the very least, I need something to align this top board so that it'll fit properly. And so this is the fixture frame that I came up with. This is a 3D printed part that sits on top. The holes line up with the holes in the PC board so I can screw it down and it gives me a way to easily just drop this booster pack board in for testing and uh, pull it out and test the next one. And so the way it sits in here, you can see the spring-loaded test pins stick out the top and make contact with the board. And then, you know, just to wrap the whole package up, I designed a frame to fit between the boards and a frame to sit on the bottom, and then the whole thing will be held together with screws. Now, of course, in order for this to work, everything has to be the right size. Specifically, these screw holes have to line up between the 3D printed parts that I'm making and the PC board here that I'm having made at a fab and the PC board that came from TI in this launch pad. So let's get some stuff out of the way here and measure the board spacing or measure the hole spacing. So I can just bring up my inspect tool, select the center of this hole, select the center of this hole, and we can see that the distance there is five inches, 950 thousandths. I'm doing this in inches because the board's designed using mills, which are thousandths of an inch. So it's five, 950, the long direction between the pins, or between the holes, and if I measure this direction, it's two 100, so it's 2.1 inches. Let's throw one of these parts on the printer and see what we get. So file, 3D print, select the part, and we'll drop that into Simplify 3D. Now, of course, the first thing I run into is that the part's the wrong orientation. Control L, select a facet on the bottom, and then center and arrange, and prepare to print. Just checking this to make sure the slicing solution looks reasonable. You can see I've got some support material here, here, and here to support the overhangs. And that looks pretty good. Specifically, these holes we're concerned about. They've got nice clean perimeters around the inside. The wall thickness is sufficient. So those should come out clean enough to, uh, to work and to get good measurements off of. Let's send it to the printer and see what we get. 
I'm printing this part with eSun brand ABS Plus. Uh, the ABS Plus material is ABS, but it's not pure ABS. It has some fillers in it, so it behaves a little bit differently. The biggest difference is that it doesn't curl as much as standard ABS, which means that you can print larger parts without having as much trouble with bed adhesion around the edges as you would with straight ABS. This part's about six inches long, and at this size, I'm not getting any curling around the corners at all. Well, this is the part directly off the printer, and honestly, it looks pretty good. 3D printing is just perfect for this kind of thing because I can generate very complex geometries. You can see the positions of the holes in there, um, the outline and the bracket to hold the PC board, and, and this is a pretty complex part. Making something like this with a mill would take a lot more time and a lot more effort. So 3D printing is really my preferred process for this kind of thing. But as soon as I get this part off the printer and start fiddling with it a little bit, I start to notice some problems. First of all, this PC board should fit into this pocket in the top. I actually left a quarter of a millimeter space, so it should drop in easily. But it doesn't. I can kind of force it partway in, but it doesn't, it doesn't really fit. I mean, even if I wedge it in, you know, it doesn't fall out, it's, it's stuck. This hole in the top appears to be undersized. Now, with 3D printers, when you're talking about like the outside dimensions or the inside dimensions of something, you can run into problems just with your extrusion width. If you're squeezing too much filament, if you're over extruding, then the walls will be thicker than you want, and so you can get some issues with that. But I think that's not exactly what's going on here. I think I have the extrusion width tuned pretty well on this printer. I think what's going on is that the entire part is printed too small. And we can verify that by checking the distance between these holes. So I have some screws here, and I will just put some, I actually find one of these that's just a little bit tighter so the screw will stay put better. So put a screw through that hole, put a screw through this hole, and these screws should be spaced the same distance apart as the screw holes in the microcontroller board because this whole thing is supposed to stack up together. So let's drop this corner onto that screw and then down here at the other end, drop this corner onto that screw. And as you can see, I can get this centered in the camera frame for you, the screws do not line up. You can see that the screw's there, but the part is actually just a little bit too short. That looks to me, to my calibrated eyeball, like maybe about half a millimeter. So the part overall is actually too short by about half a millimeter. And that's not a matter of just uh, extra material squeezing out the sides from over extrusion or under extrusion because that over or under extrusion would be around the entire perimeter of the hole. So the actual location of the hole is off. The holes are too close together. The part is actually too small. So let's measure and see exactly how small the part is. I've got my collection of pins here, gauge pins, and I'm just gonna find a couple that fit in the hole here. And way too small. Okay, that one fits pretty well. That's 121 thousandths. I'm just trying to find two pins that fit tightly enough that they, they retain in the hole. Okay, I think that's gonna be close enough. Now, I don't really care what the diameter of these pins is. I'm gonna take the measurement on the outside of the pins and the measurement on the inside of the pins and we'll average that together. So we're talking about a hole here, hole here, hole here, hole here, and we're talking about the inside dimension here and we're talking about the outside dimension. Now let's take some measurements. Try to get this where you can see it too. The inside dimension between the pins looks like about five. I can do this and get it straight. Five, seven, eighty-seven. 
And around the outside, looks like six o thirty. And I want to be as accurate as I can. There's going to be some measurement error, so I'm going to move these pins to the other side. And let's take another measurement there. Okay, so those are the numbers for the length. Let me also, while I'm at this, take some measurements on the width. This one's not going to be as accurate because there's no supporting plastic right between them, so there could be a little bit of flex, but we'll go ahead and take the numbers anyway. Okay, so we've got some numbers here of the actual dimensions of the part or actual distance between the holes, and we'll take these into the computer in a minute and crunch them and see what's actually going on with the part. But uh, let's talk for a minute about why this might be happening. So there's, there's different sources of error. It could be the printer, right? There could be something wrong with the printer that it just physically is not calibrated right and it physically is just printing the part the wrong size. Now this particular printer uses uh, stepper motors and pulleys with GT2 timing belt to move the axes of the printer back and forth. And so I think we can rule out lost steps on the stepper motors because you know the part builds from the bottom to the top with all the layers aligned. So we're definitely not losing steps. If we were losing steps, top layers would be shifted and off in weird places. We wouldn't be losing steps during, during a layer and then catching up and having all the layers come out even. So it's definitely not that. The only thing that it really could be is either the calculations in the printer for how many steps to move are wrong. I'm pretty sure those are right because I calculated them. I didn't measure them. I didn't do any kind of adjustment. I just calculated them off the mechanics of the printer. And the printer is moving, again, with two millimeter pitch timing belts. And so if the pitch of the timing belt was wrong, then you know a certain one revolution of the motor, which would be 200 full steps on the stepper motor, is going to move it with a 20 tooth pulley and a two millimeter pitch it's going to move it 40 millimeters, and that should be as accurate as the pitch of the timing belt. So is the pitch of the timing belt wrong? I guess it's possible, but the timing belts are not made in a continuous process. They're made wrapped around a mandrel with the teeth in it, um, and they're actually formed and vulcanized in the rubber on that. So the chance of the timing belt having the wrong pitch or the process drifting over time, that seems pretty unlikely to me. I'm pretty sure we're dealing with something else. Let's take a look at the filament that I'm using here. This is E-Sun, uh, one and three quarter millimeter black ABS plus. And of course it comes in a whole variety of different colors. I'm using black because black. Um, but let's scroll down here and there's something interesting in the listing. Their main advertising point on the ABS plus is that it has much less warp than ABS. And they give you some numbers here. Typical ABS has over 0.8% shrinkage rate ABS plus is less than 0.4%. So there's a benchmark number. We would expect that this material as it cools is going to shrink 0.4%. And I think that's the majority of what we're seeing when the parts come out undersized. Now, like I said earlier, it's entirely possible that there's something mechanically wrong with the printer or there's something wrong with the printer settings but you know me and you know my attention to detail i think it's pretty unlikely that that's the case it's possible but i think it's much more likely that we're dealing with shrinkage and this 0.4 percent seems like a reasonable number now that i think is a marketing number so if the reality came out a little higher than that, it wouldn't surprise me at all because, again, it's marketing. They're trying to make this look as good as possible. Well, let's take a look at the numbers we got and see how they compare to this number. Now, I'm just going to pull in Excel here, and let's enter the numbers that, that we got for this. So let's start with the, uh, the length and then put in the width. Okay, so for length, I got a bunch of numbers and I'm just gonna average all of them, the inside ones and the outside ones. And if we average them all together, it should compensate for errors and it should also uh, compensate for the difference of, between the inside and outside with the pin thickness. So 5.790, 5.790. 
Okay, so these are our averages for the length and the width. Now we know what the actual size was supposed to be. We know that this was supposed to be 5.95 and this was supposed to be 2.1. So what did we actually get? So this is desired, this is actual. So what we actually got was equals desired over actual. This came out to 99.3%. Let me just make these percentages and get a couple more decimal places on this. 99.36%, 99.49%. So you can see in this case, we were about half a percent under. In this case, we were a little bit more than half a percent under. And so if that's what we actually got, those numbers are pretty close. If I just take the average, whoops, if I just take the average of those and subtract that from 100, that's about 0.58% shrinkage. Now they're claiming that the filament should give us 0.4% shrinkage. And what we actually observed with our measurements, which, you know, granted were not super accurate. I took them with calipers. The part was flexible. Um, the holes, of course, aren't entirely clean because there's little imperfections in the surface. The pins were different sizes. The holes probably weren't exactly round because of, um, you know, just goobers where the filament uh, starts and stops. So this is in the ballpark, though. They call it 0.4%. I'm measuring 0.58%. I'm going to take a figure of probably 0.5% and say that's probably a reasonable amount to increase this by. So if I scale the part up by 0.5%, we should be very close to the correct size. So let's give that a try. Okay, we'll pop back over here into Fusion 360 and we'll 3D print this part again. Click on it send it over to simplify 3d and of course we have the same problem here we have to rotate it Control l and now we want to scale the part down or scale the part up by 0.5 percent so if i just double click on this it opens up this window over here and we have the scale factor so there's a check mark for uniform scaling so we'll scale it up in all three axes at the same time and I'll say 100.5%. Now when I press enter, watch right over here and you'll see the part grow ever so slightly, okay? Enter. You can see that that moved just a tiny bit because we scaled it up ever so slightly, zero point, or we scaled it up by 0.5%. So we'll center that up, prepare to print, and we'll slice this and send it off to the printer. And again, the slicing plan looks pretty much exactly the same. And that tiny increase in uh, size didn't really change anything. So the holes are still clean. So we should be able to print this. Before we send it to the printer though, this is something we're gonna have to do all the time, right? Every time we print something, if we want the dimensions to come out right, which of course we want the dimensions to come out right, we're gonna have to do this every single time. So a good way to do this in Simplify 3D is to just set it as a default so that every time we import a part, it automatically scales it up. So let me delete this part. And we can do that by going up to Tools, Options, and go to the Models tab. And there is a set of Import Actions. So I can come down here, select Scale All, set this to 100.5%, click add and now every time a part comes in it'll automatically be scaled up by 100.5 percent now keep in mind that setting this as a default could get you into trouble if you switch to a different filament that has a different shrink rate so you have to be aware of that i wish there was a way to set this up for the as a default for the filament type i don't see a way to do that if you know a way to do that in simplify 3d throw it down in the comments and let us all know and, uh, and solve that problem for us. But for now, this is all I know to do is to put it into the models tab as an import default. Now you also notice that it came in up on edge rather than laying flat. 
And that's because the default axes in um, Fusion 360 has the Y axis up and the Z axis forward. And in, Fu and in Simplify 3D, the Z axis is up. So pretty much every time I bring something in, I have to then lay it down flat. So I'm gonna go ahead and set a default for that as well. So I'll select Rotate X and I'll set this to minus 90 degrees and add that. So now every time I import anything into Simplify 3D, it'll scale it up by half a percent and rotate at minus 90 degrees. Okay, let's try that again. So now file, 3D print, click on the part, click okay. And it drops right into Simplify 3D, already laying flat on the bed. And if we double click on it, you can see there's the X rotation minus 90 degrees and the scale factor for all three axes is already set to 100.5%. So there's nothing we need to do. We can just slice this and send this to the printer. Of course, the dimensions on this print are only different from the previous one by about half a millimeter, so it's difficult to see the difference. And as far as you know, I might even be reusing the same video clip. Well, here is the new part, fresh off the printer. Let's see if it's any better. First test, does the PC board fit? And in fact, it does. It just drops right in, no drama at all, and in fact, falls right out. There is just a little bit of motion in it. I can rock it back and forth a little bit. Um, to my calibrated eyeball, that seems about right for the quarter millimeter of space that I left when I modeled the part. So that's good. Let's check out the screw holes. Let me put in a couple of screws here. And we will grab the PC board, drop it onto that one, and then bring it down here and see, does it fit over the screw? And it does, look at that, perfect fit. Why well, it's not even, it's not even touching the sides. That is just perfectly centered, it just drops right in. Now any 3D printing technology that processes the material hot is gonna suffer from this. The part's gonna get smaller when it cools. That applies to the fuse deposition modeling like uh, my printer. That'll apply to selective laser sintering. It's going to apply to printers with a heated chamber because the part will be kept hot longer and not warm, but then when it cools, it's still gonna shrink. But as you can see, it's not hard to compensate. You can just measure the results that you're actually getting Figure out the correct scaling factor. You can do a sanity check by checking the shrink factor specification for the material you're using. And then you can uh, just put that in your software and get the results that you need. Now, it wouldn't surprise me at all if the high-end commercial devices that I can't afford do that compensation automatically. But like I said, it doesn't matter because I can't afford those devices. Well, that's it for today. I ran into this issue this week, so I thought I'd share the solution. The boards for this test fixture and the first batch of boards for the electronic lead screw have actually been shipped now from the fab, so we should have those back shortly. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, feel free to subscribe to the channel, and leave me a comment. I'd like to know what you think. Thank you for watching.